Diane Renee and a little thing called Navy Blue here on WSEFM. Good morning, Carl Green. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Rich. Yeah. Uh, for for the, anybody who doesn't know who Carl Green is, and there can't be very many people in the world, Carl Green was one of the founding members of Herman's Hermits. And uh, as a matter of fact, you were you were playing with a group called the Heartbeats, right? We're, yeah, we're the Heartbeats for the band that, that uh, later on became Herman and the Hermits. Yeah. There's myself and Peter Noon mm-hmm. and three other guys played in the Heartbeats. Yeah, but and, wasn't but, it actually you that suggested to Peter, uh, Peter that he uh, form a group? Yeah, well, uh, I was in the, the Heartbeats before Peter, and mm-hmm. um, none of us wanted to sing particularly. I was playing guitar at the time. Yeah. And um, the bass player of the band, a guy called Lyle Ridley, mm-hmm. he knew of this guy called Peter New, who was supposed to be a good singer, and th- th- a guy that all the ladies liked, and all the girls. <laughs> we were only sort of 15 years yeah. old. I think I may have been even for, for me and Peter were probably about 14, 15 at the time. And uh, we went, we played a youth club and asked Peter if he wanted to come up and sing a song. So he came and sang a song with us. And uh, the girls loved him. So we said, to, you know, do you, want, do you want to come and join the band? He said, yeah, fine. <laughs> so he joined the band, and uh, the band sort of morphed. Mm-hmm. Different people left and different people came in. Uh, yeah. A guy called Al Shadwick, who was the lead guitar player, left because his girlfriend was moaning at him all the time because she never saw him. And that's when Keith Hopwood, um, an original Herman Samuels, came mm-hmm. into the band. Mm-hmm. And then we went for uh, our management got us a, a, a record test with Mickey Most down in London. Oh wow! We went, there, we went down there and just played a couple of numbers for him. And uh, Mickey said that we, we we needed to get rid of the bass player and the drummer, uh-huh. who were Al Wrigley and Steve Titchington. Uh, so we had to sort of say to them, "Sorry, but you you're out of the band," you know. Mm-hmm. And we couldn't find another bass player uh, because they were very scarce in those days. So I, I, I suggested that I go from guitar to bass, mm-hmm. and we got a new lead guitar player in and a new drummer in, and that was Lech Lechenby and uh, Barry Whitham. And that's the band that became Herman and the Hermit. <laughs> uh, oh, I do so, want to ask so, you... So, sorry, go on. Yeah, I was going to ask you, it was simply because of my uh, shared last name, uh, uh, tell me something about Al Wrigley. I know that uh, he wasn't with the band very long, and he got cut out in the very first um, round there, but uh, what kind of guy was he? Well, he was—he actually started the band. I think he was the guy that sort of put the heartbeats together. Uh-huh. He hired—he hired me from another band called the, the Balmains, uh-huh. um, and he was a really nice guy, very nice guy. And, and I always thought that he was um, a real ladies' man. But when, years later, I found out that he was—he was either gay or, and he got put away. He got him put into prison for um, paedophilia. Oh yeah, I believe it. Uh, oh man, and uh, he was in he was in jail for quite a while, and died very quite young. I think he got cancer. Wow! And he he died many many years ago. Mm. A, a broken man actually. He um, he never got over being, you know, having to leave the band that later became successful. I think it really affected him. Mm-hmm. But uh, he he was when I when I was in the band, I always thought he was he was a good looking guy. He looked a bit like Marlon Brando. Oh. And I always thought he was a real ladies man. It was later on found out that uh, he was anything but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of like uh, what was his name? Uh, the big actor over here that turned out to be um, uh, gay as well. Um, oh, I don't know. Oh, I'm trying to remember his name. He's he's very famous. I'm having one of those senior moments. You know, they come along more and more these days. <laughs> I have them. Definitely, yes. After yeah. <laughs> years go by. Yeah. But so this rock and roll keeps me young, you know. Oh yeah, you've got to tell me about it. I, that's, that's what I'm using to keep me young too. Is good old rock and roll. <laughs> the the uh, the, uh, um, the the sessions that you were doing with Mickey Most, yeah. Uh, did he? I heard that he brought in some session musicians to play with you guys. Uh, yeah, on, on some of the later stuff, he brought in session guys. But um, we, we 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 resented the fact actually, and we told him, you know, uh, on one of the records. He hired a guy called Vic Flick um, to play the guitar intro to Silhouettes. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it took Vic so long to try and learn the thing that Lech actually came, stepped up and said, you mean like this? <laughs> so Lech played on that, yeah. <laughs> but so we had, we had um, John Paul Jones mm-hmm. uh, from Led Zeppelin. He arranged most of our stuff. He played piano and double bass on some stuff. Yeah. Didn't Jimmy um, Page play with you guys too? Sorry? Didn't Jimmy Page play with you guys too? He played on a couple of records. Uh-huh. I'm not. I, I can't remember which ones that Jimmy played on. But uh, John Paul Jones actually toured with us 
a mm-hmm. keyboard player for a little while. We did a tour of Germany. Mm-hmm. And he came along as a keyboardist and played with us. He, he, he was a really good friend. Yeah. And he, <laughs> he did all the string arrangements, all the piano arrangements and brass and stuff for things like Kind of Hush. Mm-hmm. And he played double bass and Kind of Hush and I played a Fender. Um, but, uh, so, yeah, there was towards the end there were things like where uh, here comes the star mm-hmm. and years may come and the things that Peter did on his own they were all session guys. Yeah, I remember from some liner notes of albums and stuff like that. Sometimes you're referred to as Carl Anthony instead of Carl Green. Uh, yeah, well, my middle name is Anthony. Yeah. yeah. So was that just something you did for a uh, a shtick or or just uh, just happened that way sometimes? Um, I wasn't aware that they didn't use the green. Um, <laughs> and they, they, that must have been a mistake, which I've never seen an album with just Carl Anthony on. Yeah. But uh, I'm prepared to take your word that that is so. But uh, no, it wasn't anything that I instructed or anything like that. No, yeah. I've always been Carl Green. Yeah, I, I do remember that uh, you were referred to as Carl Anthony in a couple of 16 magazine uh, articles. So, oh right, yeah. Right. So, well, you know, <laughs> they, they they go out there and get the story. They did they did a story on you just about every month in 1965. It seems like that's right. In, yeah, sixteen magazine and Tiger Beat did a lot as well. Oh yeah, yeah. Because yeah, funnily enough, I was talking to the editor of Tiger Beat mm-hmm. magazine last week. Mm-hmm. I've not spoken to her for well, forty years, and then out of the blue, I <laughs> get a message to call her. Yeah. Wow. Great. Well, I've, I've actually been meeting up with lots of people in the last year that I've not seen for 30, 40 years. It's incredible. Yeah, you retired in, in 1980, if my information is correct. Is that correct? Yeah, I left the band in 1980 uh-huh. to start a family. Ah. And um, I, I have three daughters now, ah. all grown up. In fact, one of them has just gone to Japan for a while for, uh, for vacation. She messaged me the other day and said she was just about to get on the flight <laughs> to Japan. She's going to be a uh, world traveler. They're all globetrotters, yeah. They all go, love to see the world and get out and about, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, now they're all grown up. That's the reason I've come back, because uh, last year was our 50th anniversary of the first record coming out. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I, with my daughters being grown up, they've all left home. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought it's a bit of me time now, and I came over to thank the fans for 50 years of the good life, you know. So, are you, yeah, but you're not touring yet. Um, no, no, sense. I... Um, I'd like to, but I'm having a bit of, not, not problems, but, you know, you have to go through the hoops to get all these work visas and things. All the papers. So, yeah, all the paperwork. <laughs> so eventually, I'd like to come and live here. This is this is my plan. Oh. I'd well, like to make that space my sort of permanent home. You guys first came over in 65, is that correct? If I remember correctly. 64, late 64, 64, late 64. 64. We came over on our first trip. <clears throat> mm-hmm. We didn't actually tour on that trip. We just did some television mm-hmm. and some radio stuff. We did the Murray the K show. Oh, yeah. And I, I think we did a hullabaloo in L.A. Mm-hmm. on our first trip. But, uh, no, we, our first proper tour was in 65 when we did the Dick Clark Caravan of Stars. Mm-hmm. Um, and we started off way down the way down the bill. Bobby V was the headliner. And we were quite far down the bill, and halfway through the tour, which, um, I mean, something good was sort of hovering around the charts. Mm-hmm. And halfway through the tour, Mrs. Brown sort of shot to number one. Yeah. And uh, they decided <laughs> to sort of give poor old Bobby V uh, the second bill spot and put us at the top. And he was very good about it. He was, you know, he sort of said, I don't mind. You guys do what you will, and uh, was very, very kind about it, yeah. Oh, that's nice. Really nice guy. A nice guy. Who yeah, else? Yeah, very is? nice guy. Um, speaking of people you may have toured, I don't know. I've never seen anything in the literature about it, but did you ever uh, meet or tour with Helen Shapiro back in the day? Um, no, we didn't tour with mm-hmm. her, but I've met her at a couple of shows since I left the band because she, mm-hmm. she does a lot of 60s revival thing in England. And uh, I know a lot of the old 60s bands that still tour, like the Searchers and... Uh, Swinging blue jeans and oh, yeah. <laughs> frogs and all that lot. You know, they all still do the, their bit on the 60s scene in England. Mm-hmm. In fact, Barry, our drummer Barry Whitton, he goes, still goes out as, as Herman's Hermits in England. And I think Peter, Peter Noon tours as Peter Noon's Herman's Hermits over here. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's a couple <laughs> of Herman's Hermits touring at the yeah. moment. Are you still in touch with Peter? Yeah, I actually saw him on the 4th of July uh, oh, wow. a week and a half ago. Mm-hmm. I went to what he had a concert in a, a suburb of Chicago. It's uh, Elgin, I think you pronounce it. We, we pronounce yeah. it Elgin, but uh, 
you Americans call it L, L jeans. That's it. We go with the soft so jeans. You're getting told off for saying it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I went to see him at L Gin mm-hmm. and I uh, went backstage to sort of say hi, and uh, it was nice. It was oh, nice good. To, yeah. to, to go, you know, he remembered things like going to rehearsals on our bikes when we were real young kids. You know, we used to go and rehearse, and I used to use my mother's bike with a wicker basket on the front, like the Wizard of Oz one. You know. Oh, yeah. I remember... What well, well, forgets all these things for someone who <laughs> reminds you? Well, I'll tell you what. I don't know if you have a chance to listen to Peter Noon's radio show on Sirius XM, but he's been talking about a lot of those old memories, and there was a discussion of the bicycles, as a matter of fact, one time. <laughs> really? Yeah. Uh, well, what's, that on, what's the name of the show? It's called uh, I'm Into Something Good, amazingly enough. <laughs> on, on Sirius FM, on, yeah? Yeah, on 60s on, on 6. On, on, say that again. Sorry. At 60s on 6. On Sirius XM, there. he does a show. Right. I, I think it's Saturday afternoons or Saturday evenings. So, uh, oh yeah, he must have done it that day because it was. A, I think it was a Saturday. I saw him. Yeah, yeah. So, he may have done it that morning. Can you? Does he do that? Have to go into the studio to do that, or can he do it over the telephone? He, well, he's he does it in a studio somewhere. He may not be doing it in the main studios. A lot of those disc jockeys on that station actually uh, connect up to the station via the internet and do their shows. Oh right, yeah, yeah. So okay. it's. The business has changed so much since back in the day, I tell you what. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm, I mean, I'm just in the process of getting, um, because the masters are stuck in customs, mm-hmm. uh, the guy that mastered the records in England, he's he's trying to get them to me via the internet on a thing called Dropbox. I don't know if you've heard of it. Yep, but, yep, uh, I'm familiar with it. It's a long it. process of sending <laughs> yeah. big files through mm-hmm. there, though. But at, yeah. least, at last, I'm getting something, you know, so I can actually play stuff to people. Well, I'll be looking to, to receive some files from you guys when you get everything and worked out. Uh, so oh, I can definitely. Play You're here, on so. the list for sending all yeah. you know, stuff out to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanna, I, I'm going to give you one of these 16 magazine quotes from Peter as he describes you back in 1965. He'll do anything for a laugh. His hobby is collecting money, and he's dry, dying to own his own posh Mercedes car. He digs really hot curry and small birds with lots of eye makeup and long <laughs> black hair. <laughs> now, my question is, did you ever get that Mercedes? Yeah, I've got a Mercedes at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> so you still love those, <laughs> those Mercedes? I have a sports Mercedes, but now I just drive a, a big, what do you call them, station wagons over here. Oh, so yeah. I can get, I've got a Mercedes, uh, we call them estate cars. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the one without the, the trunk. It's just a big tailgate at the back. It's just so I can get amplifiers in the back. You know? Oh, wow. Yeah. Amplifiers and guitars. Because <laughs> being a bass player, you've got to carry big gear around all the mm-hmm. time. When you walked back into the studio to record your new CD, The Long Road Back, mm-hmm. did you uh, did you notice the difference in technology from the days when you were recording with Hermits? Oh, definitely, yeah. yeah. I mean, our first record we did uh, back in 64, we did on half track. We did the backing on one side of the tape, mm-hmm. the vocals on the other side of the tape, mixed the two together and did the, the, the overdubs for the vocals. Now you've got unlimited tracks, um, and it's all digital, so you can actually... Mm-hmm. Put the, you know, if someone drops a clam, you don't have to redo the whole take. You just do that one note. You know, yeah. It's so much easier these days. Yeah, I tell you. And you, you have things like voice correction and all this sort of stuff. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But the trouble is, everybody has the has a tendency to say, oh, we'll fix it in the mix. So you, you end up with the sessions being very quick. And I was sat in the studio for nearly two months putting everything right, you know. Everything in post-production. You know, every now and then, though, when they say that, and they get into post-production, they start messing with it, they can't quite fix it the way you want it. Exactly, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, we had a problem in the studio on a couple of tracks that the the gate wasn't on the drums wasn't working properly, so mm-hmm. I had to redo a lot of the drums myself. Oh, wow. Um, just, just taking samples from Gina's original... Um, playing mm-hmm. and cut and paste a lot of the kick. It was a kick drum that just kept disappearing. So I had to take samples of the kick earlier in the song and put them later and just make sure all the velocities were, were correct so that you get the feel right. Oh, yeah. And that can take a long time. I mean, it, they say this digitization actually makes things quicker, but in some ways I think it makes things longer because you have to yeah. mess with it, mess with it. And, yeah, I see. It's very mm-hmm. tedious work. Yeah. Well, it's, it's you know all technical and no artistic. You know, you, you've got to put your technical hat on and then when you come to, to mix, you put your, your, your artistic hat back on. You know, it's, it's been two, two completely different ideas. One, once you're a technician, you, you forget all about the music, musicality. You, you're thinking too much of all the, you know, the, the frequencies and all this sort of stuff. It becomes all waveforms and frequencies at that point. That's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, to me, I mean, I'm, I'm so old school, that's just not music, you know. I'm, I'm all about uh, 
as a matter of fact, I really prefer a lot of stuff that's, and there's some artists still do record analog. And, uh, yes, yes. And, uh, well, I must admit that I would rather the mm-hmm. band just sit down and, and play, and whatever comes out, that's what goes on the record, because that's how you get the feel. And there's things, you know, things like a um, whole lot of love. Mm-hmm. Tempos are up and down. Mm-hmm. They're all over the place, but that's what makes it exciting. Yeah? Yeah. And if you listen to I'm in something good, there's no, there's no click track, there's no, uh, no overdubs, because we had to do it in the studio. Yeah. Mrs. Brown, we did it all in one take. You know? Exactly. In, 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 Mrs. Brown, Mickey said, do you know a song to put on the album? And we played him the song. Mrs. Brown, and he said, yeah, that's great. And we said, are you going to record it? And he said, I just did. (laughs) (laughs) Go in and put some vocals on, and that's it. You know, it took five minutes to do Mrs. Brown. You know, really? It was was a a one-take song, huh? Yeah. Wow. (laughs) Because we just thought it was an album filler. You know, we we sort of Mm. put it on just to fill the album up. Mm -hmm. Um, And then all the disc jockeys in the States said, yeah, yeah, this is a great record. Why don't you release it as a single? And, and he and really. Mickey turned around and says, I'll release it as a single when we get a million advanced copies. <laughs> and we, we got that, uh, that million advance orders, and uh, the rest, as they say, is history. Wow. It went straight to number one. And uh, we be, overnight, we became big stars. It's, <laughs> no one was more surprised than us, believe me. <laughs> you know, speaking of a recording um, analog and doing things in one take and all of that kind of mm-hmm. a, approach. Uh, to me, artists that record analog and do things in one take the way you guys used to do back in the day, um, mm-hmm. when they go on tour, it's more real. Um, oh, yeah. You know, yeah. because you know, it, it, sometimes when you have artists that do all this digital monkeying around with the stuff, when you hear them on tour, it's, it doesn't sound anything like the, the CD or the album. It's, it's, exactly. It's all different, you know. <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you do lots of overdubs, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, could, I can go on a record and, and lay five different guitar tracks. Yeah. But I can't play those five guitar tracks when I go and play live, you know. So uh, it's, it's always best to keep it as simple as possible. Yeah. Uh, especially if the guitar, if the band is only guitar, two guitars, bass, and drums. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got keyboards on a couple of the tracks, but we will carry a keyboard player with us. You know, it's, you've got mm-hmm. it's got to be done. You can't sort of go on. Like when we were on tour as Hermes Hermes, we couldn't take strings with us. So kind of hush was, <laughs> yeah. was never sounding like it should, you know, like the record, apart from. A couple of times we had orchestras with us in Brazil mm-hmm. and Argentina. Oh, wow! But uh, so where yeah, all, generally we where all sorry, did go you? Go, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying. Go, go ahead. What were you saying? Okay, so where all did you wind up touring during uh, the heyday of uh, Hermits Hermits? Oh, we took mostly toured the states, uh, but we did, did uh, uh, Brazil, Argentina, Australia, the Philippines, Japan, Hong Kong, uh, Germany, Italy, France. Uh, Sweden, mm-hmm. Norway, Finland, just about everywhere apart from um, the USSR, as it was in the day, Russia. <laughs> That's right. We didn't go anywhere. We didn't do any Iron Curtain countries apart mm-hmm. from, well, we, we played in Berlin, but it was always West Berlin, not East Berlin. Oh, I wonder if they could hear you in East Berlin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, think, I mean, East Berlin now have the bands going over because they were starved for so many years of, of entertainment. Mm-hmm. And it, it was a very lively country now, you know, only because of unification. You know, everything's oh, yeah. happening over there. Yeah, lots of, lots of changes. So mm-hmm. during the time that you were uh, raising your family and getting your family started and everything, what did you do for a living? I started a tiling business, would you believe? I, uh, I had a business that renovated kitchens and bathrooms. Mm-hmm. And I also had another business that anti-slipped, Leslie Center and uh, swimming pool areas and things like that all the tiled floors that had, got slippy when they were wet oh yeah I had a pro, I, I had a process that you treated the floor to make it non-slip with believe it or not an American product I used to import the chemicals from San Diego back over to England <laughs> and uh, and you know sort of transfer for the, transfer these um, dangerous floors into safe areas mm-hmm. you gotta, so you it was great he was very good to me. I had, a, you know, I had a, a, some good years doing that. Made made reasonable amount of money to bring my family up. So, and I retired from that all that business in 2011, mm-hmm. and thought I'll just, just, you know, sort of be a retired guy until in 2014. Uh, a guy called Conor Mahoney got in touch with me on Facebook and said, well, "Would I be interested in coming over and playing with some friends of his, some bands that played all Hermes Hermits music?" And I said, "Why not? Why not? I'm yeah. up for anything." 
So that's you're... what started all this, me coming back here. I'm <laughs> loving it. Got you back into your first love. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and actually, it's keeping me young. You know, I'm, I'm loving every minute of it. It's great. i got to wonder how many people in the UK are, are now just saying to themselves, you mean I have a bathroom that was done by yeah. Herman Dermott? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I did a lot of, of really top-end stuff, though. I was very lucky. I would lived in an area with, with very expensive properties around. Mm -hmm. And I would spend, you know, at one house, I've spent nearly two years on the one house, mm -hmm. working on one house, doing lots of bathrooms, swimming pool floors, swimming pools around, servants' quarters, the whole bit, you know, massive, massive houses. Oh, wow. Uh, I was, it was very good to me. The business was very good to me, but it, it took its toll on my body. I have to I had to have a, a knee replacement because of kneeling Yikes. down so long. You know, <laughs> I've got a friend who had a knee replacement just for getting up and off stage. <laughs> <laughs> Some of those stages were were interesting to get up on. <laughs> oh yeah, I fell off a few. The studied barriers, but. You know, fell off a few stages. Oh, you know, you haven't you haven't been in a rock and roll band unless you've fallen off a stage at least once. Oh, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, Carl, this has been a. I've really enjoyed this conversation. I hope you have too. It's, it's been yeah, a, a certainly lot of fun. Average, yeah. Um, you know, uh, you, how long are you going to be in the states before you go back to England? I go back on the third of August. Uh -huh. My flight is on the third of August. I get back there on the fourth because mm -hmm. it's uh, an overnight flight, and then I start work on the fifth, working with some heavy metal bands doing festivals over there because I'm also a qualified sound engineer. Oh, yeah. I, 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 uh, I run front of house sound for a lot of really heavy bands, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll be doing a thing called Rebellion, which is all really hard rock. <laughs> and a couple of other gigs with a band called the Heavy Metal Kids. Oh, yeah. yeah. Who had some kind of success over here in the early 70s, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems to me I remember that the fellow who was the engineer for the Beatles in the BMI days also wound up having a couple of hits of his own. Yeah, yeah. Well, it helps if you're a muso being doing sound because you know what the talent wants. You know, yeah. I know exactly what sort of sound people want on their monitors. Mm -hmm. I know what sort of front of house all these guys want. I, I'm big. Being a bass player, I like a lot of kick. Oh well, yeah, and a lot of bass. <laughs> so once you get the bottom end sitting right, everything else sits just beautifully on top. You yeah. know. You don't want no sloppy bass around here. <laughs> That's a, I like a thunderous sound. You know, I like the bottom end to thunder right out and mm -hmm. hit you in the chest. Mm -hmm. And oh, yeah. if you get the bottom end right, everything else sounds good. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the thing that drives the whole song. <clears throat> You know, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Without the bass and, and kick drum, it's not rock. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, Carl, thank you for coming in this morning and talking with us. This, and and make sure that when you come back um, to the states, that you get back in touch with me through your contacts and everything. And we'll need to connect up on Facebook. Is what we'll need to do. So we I can, will do. We Rich, can do that. Definitely. And, uh, and uh, so we can, you know, keep in touch because I definitely would like to follow you when you come back to the states and see what you're doing. Okay, I will right now, when we finish, I will go on Facebook and I'll send you a friend, friend request. Sounds good. And then I will uh, uh, have my phone right here, so I'll be answering it, too. <laughs> okay. So, Carl, thank All you right so then. much. And keep in touch, my friend. Thank you very much okay. indeed. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Bye. And that was Carl Green, who is uh, the uh, bass player for Herman Hermits. He was one of the original members of the band when uh, they first formed way back in 1964. Live on an interview here on WSCFM. The child that was sent to its room too many times without supper. 90.5 WUSC-FM Columbia.